All right, thanks, Brian. So uh, I think uh, one of the things I've noticed in the last uh, couple of days is uh, yesterday I decided there was a bit of a format explosion. Uh, we heard about at least 192 different image formats. And today I'm getting the impression there's something of a metadata explosion with all the different initiatives in the facilities and other places to uh, create a lot of metadata. So one of the thrusts of my talk is going to be to try and get a handle on how we can think about all of these, uh, get a handle on all of this variety. Uh, so just to, to set the scene, in terms of transferring scientific knowledge, the way things have happened in the past and are still happening today, one way of transferring the knowledge is the scientist writes a paper, it's uh, transferred to another scientist in the post or through a publication. They read it and they understand it because they share a common ontology. They share a common understanding of the terms. So in this very simple example, you can see, oh no, you can't see, there's the abbreviation RA in that little table. And uh, obviously, whoever's reading it is assumed to understand what RA might mean. And without that shared understanding, nothing is obviously transmitted. Now, when we come to using computers, we get another collaborator in this, uh, in this system, and that's the, uh, those are the computer programmers that are also drawing on the same ontology in order to encode the information into the data file. So the data file is then transferred. The, uh, the software at both ends understands something about what's in the data file, and then that is communicated to the scientist at the end of the process. Now, it's very important uh, to understand what I'm talking about here is software that's actually doing something with the data. So if all it's doing is it's passing along a text field, that's not what I'm talking about. That's essentially the uh, process I talked about in the previous slide, when, uh, which could have been mediated by a computer if it's just a Microsoft Word document that's being displayed. So I'm talking about software that actually does something with the data, it uses the wavelength to calculate a despacing or something like that. Of course, this is a lovely simple picture, but in actual fact, as we've heard, there are all sorts of different formats. And the first thing, I, the first comment I would make here is all of these different uh, formats are, uh, are going to be drawing on the same ultimate understanding of, of the world, if they're in the same uh, topic area. But nevertheless, whoever's designed this format, designed the specification, has had to restate some of that ontology, restate some of those meanings and uh, in addition to having to, to grapple with the particular file format that might have been chosen to express that ontology. So what I'm, uh, what I'm on about here is to uh, try and get a, a bit of a grip on this variety and, and uh, try and simplify it as much as it can be simplified for the benefit of the uh, programmers, perhaps first of all. And it is hard work uh, developing ontologies. I think most of the people in this room uh, uh, would uh, say. Uh, so I'd suggest a, a useful first step would be try and decouple the ontology completely from the format. And uh, we know that is a very uh, easy goal because obviously the knowledge that we transfer, the information that we transfer is not going to depend on the particular format we use. I mean, it's a blindingly obvious statement, but sometimes it's worth remembering that, that the, uh, the, the knowledge has got nothing to do with the format. So let's, uh, let's uh, focus first of all on uh, our ontology. What, what, uh, how can we express our ontology? Now this gets us into the domain of knowledge representation, which is rather esoteric, and I feel there's uh, something of an, uh, an impedance mismatch between us and the people that are working in this field, because as I tried to dive into the literature, I could, uh, it was quite difficult to understand what, uh, what the point of what they were doing was in terms of say, data files, which is uh, what we're interested in. But there was a comment, it turns out, back in 1992 by one of the early workers in this field saying, oh, you could use this for data files as well, but no one's actually picked up on that. So uh, one of the systems for representing knowledge that uh, I think is particularly attractive for what we're doing is uh, this uh, concept of an O-log for ontology log. Now all that an O-log is, you have a, uh, you essentially have classes of objects that are connected by a function, it's very important to understand that, say, a mapping, a, a mathematical mapping, 
Uh, and ideally, you can actually read out a fact of this O-log. So you can say, an image is measured at an angle. Right? Or an image has dimensions that are a pair of integers, and that this pair of integers has a first element that's an integer, for example. So that's, that's the idea of encoding information in one of these ontology logs. And one of the reasons that they are, I think, uh, the very promising is because this is a very thinly disguised uh, uh, description of a mathematical category. And category theory, for those who don't know, and I certainly didn't know until I started looking at this, is uh, a, a very abstract form of mathematics which uh, has sometimes been called the mathematics of mathematics. So you can actually apply this type of uh, description to different fields of mathematics and the theorems that come out of category theory uh, can then be applied to that particular field that you've uh, applied your, um, that you've, you've described using category theory. And of course we would hope that was the case because this is supposed to be a system for describing knowledge and a mathematical field is included in that. And uh, they're also very modular. You can obviously uh, read that uh, paper which is more or less accessible to, to, to find out more about it and there are comparisons in there to other uh, ways of describing other ontologies such as RDF format, OWL, and relational databases. I should point out that uh, those of you who have had anything to do with relational databases will probably see immediately that this looks very similar to a relational database schema because of these functional connections. One other thing that category theory, uh, an important um, uh, what we say concept in category theory is the idea of commutating paths. So for example, if we start at an image here, we can say it has horizontal dimension, an integer, and if we say that commutes with this path down here, we're essentially saying that the first element, when we describe the dimensions, is the horizontal dimension, which is a fairly trivial thing to say, but you can obviously extend this to much more sophisticated expressions. And these are called facts. In the, on, in the O-log way of looking at things, this is called a fact that you can express in your O-log. Uh, so, yes, what I'm saying is that our entire ontology can then be expressed as this set of concepts mapping domains onto ranges. And I think it's uh, probably important to underline that the concept that we would think of as our data name is in fact the function. So we're making it clear that our concept is actually connecting one thing with another thing. That said, often we will tend to identify a thing uh, not with the function, and of course we can always have an identity function, as I've drawn over here, and then we have effectively identified this, this uh, class of objects as well. Right, okay, so that's, uh, that's one structure that, one way we can structure our ontology which claims to be universal and modular. What does that mean for our data file? So we've, if you've like, we've got a structure now for our, our ontology. How does the data file fit into this? So given that we have a structure for our ontology, then our data file can do no more than give an instance of information from this ontology. There's no point in the data file restating the ontology because we already know that. And given the way I've defined things, if the data file does want to change the ontology, then that will involve a programmer at one or both ends actually having to go in there and ad adjust to that new ontology, which is essentially excluded from this scheme, if you like, because that's essentially going back to the old way of doing things first. Therefore, all that our data file is providing to us that is important is going to be attaching values to concepts. And given that we could have multiple values for a concept, so rotation angle, for example, uh, given that we can have multiple values, that means we need a way to match up. If we have multiple concepts with multiple values, so we've got an image, we've got rotation angles, we've got many images, many rotation angles we need, the data file has to be able to match rotation angle to image. And that's all we need from any data file, those three things that I've put up there. So let's just apply these ideas to uh, a simple format to start with, a CIF file. And we can see this very simple mapping, uh, a concept in our ontology log 
is just a data name. So one of those functions is just a data name. The value or values attached to that data name is either just the value next to it in the data file or the column associated with it. And the correspondence between values when you have more than one is going to be having the same column index. And we're done. So we can, from this point of view, we can say, well, the actual grouping of these data names that uh, the CIF format enforces is not telling us anything new. And of course it isn't, because that's already stated in the dictionary. We already knew that. But it's syntactically important. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, because uh, it's much more complicated. Uh, the, you know, the slides will be available for you to think about, and it, is, uh, it gets quite involved with tree structures, depending on what aspects of your file format you've used. But the essential idea is that you identify a concept with either a Nexus class or the, uh, the uh, leaf node in the class or an attribute. As far as I'm concerned, attributes and leaves are essentially the same thing. And then you can collect together all the instances of these and they're your values. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into detail because, first of all, we have an existence proof from uh, Herbert's work with the image CIF um, and NXMX mapping. And second of all, there's a very, uh, there's a very convincing discussion in this book, that I, this uh, reference that I've given down there, describing how any data structure is going to be a relational data structure plus something else. So uh, that's, uh, I don't think there's any argument about this being possible. Now, just going back a little bit to uh, our diagram, we've got a function mapping A to B, and we say that B depends on A in that case. Now, if we start to think about this, well, if we've got our calculated structure factor, that depends on a whole lot of things. Does that mean we somehow have to list every imaginable thing that this could depend upon? There are two answers to that. One answer is, well, if that's the way things are in the real world, that's the way things are in the real world. And whether you list them or not, it's still going to be true. So uh, from that point of view, well, it might be good to list as much as you can. But in terms of the data format, you really only need to list the things that actually change in the data format. So going back then to d describing your metadata, um, doing your uh, ontology, you can list all the dependencies that you expect might reasonably be used in a, in a data file, or add them on later. As I'll explain, that's not an issue. So I talked about, uh, well, I mentioned a, a data unit here in the, in the last point. And, uh, Let's uh, see if we can pin down what this is more precisely. And this essentially echoes what Andy uh, spoke about yesterday with the ESRF work. We can define a data unit in terms of our ontology as the set of uh, data names that do take multiple values within that unit. And that's essentially equivalent to saying the set of data names that don't change within that unit, but you don't necessarily know what uh, it's very hard to identify that because it's sort of a, 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 it could be seen as an infinite set. That phase of the moon doesn't change, for example. So then, uh, to specify our data unit, all we need to do is specify the items in our ontology that actually change, and I think that's a you know, fairly obvious point. So if we're just rotating the sample about one axis, we, we say rotation angle, the rotation angle defines our data unit. If we've got multiple, an, an, multiple samples, multiple axes, multiple angles, then we have to list all of those. And I think that's, that's restating the obvious in a way, because uh, that's how we all understand the data unit anyway. So then, so now we're in a position to talk about the overall framework that I'm talking about. And I don't want to give the impression that this is a new framework. What I'm saying is that any framework can be analyzed in this way. So I'm not in any way saying that you have to do things differently. I'm saying that it may be helpful to look at your data transfer framework in this way. So we have a catalog, which is our list of concepts. We assign some sort of canonical name, and we describe the range of values that that function maps to. And we identify all the names, the other names that it depends upon. So that's essentially the domain that it's mapping from. 
I've said that units don't matter at this stage. Units don't matter for the catalogue, you just give the dimension, so it's length. And that avoids all the arguments that really are pointless uh, as far as the ontology goes as to what the best units are. And you give maximum freedom to the users to decide what's most, uh, you know, what's used in their community. And uh, just as a, as a sideline, often we have, certainly in CIF, we might have a sort of a, a small finite set of values that uh, we think someone, something can take. For example, there may be a set of refinement flags that we recognise, so these should obviously also be listed in the ontology. The actual values that you choose are not as important because the next stage you'll see you can decide uh, how those are going to be represented in the, in the actual format. So we have a catalogue, and that catalogue is intended to apply to any format. And then we have what I've called a format adapter, which explains how the uh, items in that catalogue are actually mapped into a, data, a particular data format. And so you have to obviously describe how to locate the values, how the actual uh, types in your ontology are turned into to types in your format. And I, I didn't mention that before, but in your ontology you're going to be talking about real numbers, complex numbers, integers. But when you go to your data format, you're obviously going to be realising that in some way on the computer. You may be using a text string, you may be using 64-bit floating point or something like that. So that's the sort of thing that you would put in the format adapter. Importantly, you say which items, which dependencies of, of your canonical names are actually expected to change. And this is, um, this is one way that we actually future-proof our data format, and I'll explain that in a minute. So here's an example. This is in no way a, a diffraction data experiment. So it's perhaps not as appropriate, but we haven't seen any exaps yet, so this might be fun. Uh, I was uh, a participant in a, in a working group to define the exaps uh, data interchange format for a while, which was one of the things that provoked me to start thinking about this. And what the group eventually came up with was a glorified three-column ASCII format with the interesting twist that the actual... Co the um, the content of the columns could be specified dynamically in the header. So you might, you might have had transmission fluorescence or you might have had uh, not transmission, transmission absorption or fluorescence absorption and the header didn't told you what was going on there. So the catalogue, I've given one example of an entry in the catalogue you might expect to see. So it's, uh, that, that's probably sufficient to define exactly what you mean. And then an adapter document, we might have a little table saying how to extract the values of items in the catalogue that are present in the format. There's no reason to use everything in your ontology. Uh, that's, uh, that's up to the, the person defining the format to say what they would like to be in the ontology. Uh, you can see that there may be some things that are not obviously present in the uh, data file but are, are necessary. For example, the scan step. Uh, in terms of a functional relationship, sometimes you can have an energy measurement in EXAFs that comes out at exactly the same measured number. So you need to distinguish those two by some sort of a, a, a step number. And uh, you explain uh, the, uh, the data unit and how, how your values are going to be represented. And this doesn't have to be a long document. You can imagine for perhaps I would guess 70% of the 192 image formats, you could imagine that this document is going to be quite short because the actual syntax of the files may be identical, but one or two different uh, data names are present in the header, and that's how it is considered to be a different format. And for CIF, it's even easier to do. I don't think I really need to explain this very much. And there are no uh, data names for exacts yet defined in CIF. All right, so what are the benefits of doing things these, this way? I, I won't go through all of them, but uh, one benefit I think is, is, is worth uh, underlining is that up until now, because the, uh, develop, the development of the ontology has tended to be done by people that are actually working on the data format as well at the same time, uh, the development of the ontology has been restricted mostly to people that are uh, computer programmers or have a lot to do with computers. And this excludes a lot of specialists in the field that, that have a lot to contribute. So I think if we, can, uh, if we come up with a, a way of uh, specifying metadata that is simple and accessible but does not rely on any knowledge of computers, we can draw in more people to do this work. I mean, 
I know I've said that we seem to have too much metadata, we seem to have an explosion of metadata, but at the same time there is still more metadata that, that is needed for the, for the different fields. And obviously it does free up the data framework designers to, uh, to choose whatever format's suitable for them because it's, it's work that's done independent of the ontology. And uh, we keep anything to do with format, obviously, out of the ontology. Uh, this is something that sort of ties in with what Andy was talking about at the ESRF, this, uh, this middle point here, that uh, we can uh, say in uh, crystallography, we're used to thinking of uh, scanning all of the HK, indexing the peaks with HKL, and uh, then that sort of defines our data unit. But there are experiments out there where you might sit on a single peak and vary some other parameter. And that is now able to use exactly the same ontology. It's just they're going to be varying something else. HKL will be constant, but energy will be, the data unit will be defined by the energy changing. And the ontology doesn't have to change in order to accommodate that. And uh, this is probably something that's quite relevant to what we've seen, is that these are very modular ontologies. It's uh, relatively easy to, to, to join them together. And there's a, there's a theorem that is mentioned by Spivak and Kent in their paper, saying that uh, there will always be a functorial transformation, I love that word, so you will always be to, able to transform one O-log into an, another O-log in a way that preserves the facts, that preserves the commuting paths. That sounds sort of useful. Um, it's essentially an existence proof. It, in, in actual fact, there may be many ways to make this uh, transformation, so it's not completely solving the problem, but it is uh, giving us some guidelines to say that, yes, we can, rather than try and have one uniform ontology, we can actually imagine uh, defining transformations between pre-existing ontologies, and I think that's probably going to be the only way to go, given the enormous ontologies that we've seen today from the different facilities. We're probably going to be far better off finding the transformations rather than redoing the ontologies altogether. I'll skip that. Uh, here's, a, here's a little example of how we might expand the ontology without actually affecting our, our data formats. So uh, this is drawn from, from recent experience. The, the original um, idea in a SIF file is that our calculated intensity depends on the HKL index and lots of other stuff. Then we discover twinning, in which case our calculated intensity is now going to depend not only on the index, but it's also going to depend on the particular twin that this peak came from. And that will have some mass fraction which we'll, which we'll need to use to calculate what the uh, structure factor is. So if with this, we've added in twin as a dependency of the calculated structure factor. And this does not affect any uh, data files that were constructed according to this ontology because by default anything that's not explicitly varying in that file must be constant. So the, the twin, the, there was one twin and it was constant. Perhaps more interestingly, if we start producing data files that conform to this ontology, we can still transform back to this ontology by simply choosing a constant twin value and splitting it up into uh, separate data files, each, that have, each of which have a constant twin. And I think this is a very general operation in terms of moving uh, between different representations of, of the field or as the field expands. So I'll just uh, finish off by discussing a few applications of this approach. Uh, the first uh, clear point, I think, is that we can have a, a universal uh, programming interface for extracting values from a data file. Essentially, we need to simply get the values, give, give the, the name, the, the, the location that matches our concept, and a type from the ontology. So we're talking about a real number rather than a, a float 64 number. Uh, and of course, depending on the programming language you're using, you may have to specify the type. You may have to have a type-specific version of this function. And that's all we need. We've got all the values. But of course, uh, for convenience, we're probably going to 
probably going to want to uh, define a few functions like this, for example, an iterator, so that we don't have to get all of the images all at once. Um, and we, this is also a very useful function in terms of just taking the value that corresponds to some other value. And that's it. And, uh, and such a function would actually tell us a lot about the way the uh, da data are stored in that particular data format. So one suggestion I would have is that when writing a format adapter um, description, uh, some pseudocode for how this such a function might work would be very interesting. Would be a very nice specification of how the, the data are stored. You'll note that we can't really go the other way and say uh, write a set values function because that is going to involve format specific information and it may change from day to day depending on what the intended application of the, uh, the data file is. And uh, this also uh, leads us to thinking about some sort of uh, translation between data files. We can use that get values function to just uh, get our concepts with their associated values. We can apply some transformations, uh, simple transformations based on what we know about how these are related. And at this point, I would uh, like to point out, uh, it was mentioned yesterday, there's a the language DREL that's been developed for the new um, uh, CIF transfer framework is actually very well adapted to describing these types of transformations. And uh, that's something that we're going to be looking into uh, in the near future, or something I have been looking into, as to how we might describe these transformations uh, using DREL. And then the final stage is going to be somehow encoding our transformed data according to the way the format wants to do it. And that's, uh, that's obviously going to be format specific, as I said. Uh, on this topic, I'm saying these, uh, this step here involves semantically irrelevant format specific structuring rules. That, uh, that, uh, I like that separation of scientifically meaningful from uh, useful for other reasons because sometimes people get a little bit involved in their data formats and think that perhaps some structure in their data format is relevant or is, carries some sort of scientific information and that, uh, and that needs to be clarified if that is the case. And you'll note I'm not advocating for any particular data format here, quite the opposite. I'm saying that um, you're now free to choose the technically the technically most efficient uh, version or, or format for your particular application. Uh, and we've heard a little bit about cord concordances. Uh, obviously, um, Herbert Bernstein and others have done an enormous amount of work uh, to produce this concordance between ImageSIF and NXMX. Uh, my imagined concordance would be somewhat simpler than what they have done because they're ma managing to preserve all of the nexus structural information as well. And you could imagine a minimum concordance would just have a list of equivalences between the, uh, the data names appearing in both, uh, in both uh, formats. And a more full description might include functional transformations and, uh, and other useful, useful information. Uh, I don't think that's, uh, I think that's sort of uh, pretty obvious. I don't think I'll go into that. So I'd like to finish off with just a few proposals that, uh, that come out of, of this. I think it would be good to have a, a metadata concordance, uh, which is going to be relatively easy. Given what we've heard today, I don't think it's, uh, it's reasonable to expect that any one person or even any one committee would be able to maintain such a concordance, given the vast number of metadata that's around. So I think we should be looking at uh, instituting something like the, the way the semantic web is supposed to work so that individual workers can link their metadata to other pieces of metadata out there, not necessarily doing it comprehensively and not necessarily even linking all of their data, and then web crawlers or, or web agents could then go out and, and match things up uh, in, a, in a sort of an ad hoc way. I think I think it's very important to, especially for the DDDWG, to, to define exactly what it means by metadata. What is sufficient information for metadata? And uh, I suggest that these four things are sufficient and there's no need to uh, go any further. It's, uh, on the same note, I think it's extremely important to keep format-specific elements out of the metadata definition itself. <coughs> 
And uh, as I said before, I think get values, the, the pseudocode for the get values function is very helpful if you're talking about a particular format. And so to finish off, I'll just acknowledge um, some of the, uh, where, where most of these ideas came from. I don't feel like there are many original ideas in this at all. Obviously, I've mentioned Herbert and others' work on that, uh, on, the, on the concordance, which is uh, an enormous amount of work and got me thinking about some of this. There are the publications of Spivak and Spivak and Kent, which uh, they've tried very hard to make it accessible to uh, non-mathematicians. And obviously, uh, the relational model for databases has uh, flowed into being part of the SIF world for quite a long time now, and that's uh, informing some of what I'm thinking about. I've mentioned DREL and DDLM, and there were lots of interesting discussions on the XFs format development list when they uh, obviously didn't have a clue what I was talking about. And uh, in retrospect, it's probably true that, that I didn't know what I was talking about, but it provoked me to try and uh, clarify my thoughts. So I'm very grateful to them for that. And obviously, I'm uh, very grateful to Ansto for supporting this work and uh, uh, letting me come here. So thanks. Thank you very much, James. Are there any questions from the floor? <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> are, are we able to hook up the Skype session immediately? Are there any other questions? That, um... Are there any other questions while we're looking at that? So I have a bit of a surreal feeling that I've been listening and watching something different. So you use the colourful words um, explosion of formats, explosion yes. of metadata, all the different facilities, ontologies. Yes. Now my reading of what I've witnessed is that apart perhaps from MX is uh, really some excellent work going on with respect to, and we heard say from the High Pressure Commission, a very specific set of uh, metadata terms and, and to me a lot of progress in, in bringing that together which will, uh, I mean you can never prevent diversity but at least it's a clarity um, of uh, you know, what the IUCR Commission on High Pressure thinks. We see the publications from the XAFS Commission are already out there, the publication from the uh, Small Angle Commission is out there. Uh, we have in any case the de facto success story, uh, the chemical crystallography uh, sieve. Now, the extension to raw data is the task, and that is you know, still to be uh, defined by the Commission on Structural Chemistry. So in a way, I, I, where do we agree? I suppose I agree that the uh, MX shows diversity, and to table, I would invite the Chairman of the Commission on Biological Macromolecules to, to comment on how uh, he would like to see the management of the diversity to hopefully arrive at uh, some degree of, of convergence. Anyway, we'll come to that in a moment and we'll take Herbert's input where he aligns, I've learned by email, with what you're reading of the situation. So, am I being naive? It, it, it's my problem of not understanding the complexity that you have witnessed over many years with the compsives. What, you know, what am I missing here? No, well, I mean, if you take, for example, I wasn't thinking so much of the um, high pressure uh, work. I was thinking of, say, the ESRF work, these enormous lists of, of metadata. Simon's work in Southampton, he's got more enormous lists of metadata. They're all very specific, manageable, yeah, oh, prop, yeah. In proper, their own worlds, yes. respectable uh, items that are needed. Absolutely. There is no explosion here. It's a finite uh, thing. <laughs> And these are needed. I'm not saying they're not needed. I'm not saying they're not useful. But what I'm saying is they're in their own world. How, it, how can we incorporate what Simon's done into SIF? How do we do well, that? Well, you tell me. Well, well, I am. I just, uh, <laughs> this is sort of the thrust. This is a clear. This is the thrust of my talk. Is that? But this is a clear list. For, sure, from sure. So someone's got to sit down there and bring that into SIF. I mean, the, the And the find the overlaps. Find... Uh, you know, there may be, and also, I mean, Simon's done things in terms of the RDF. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. And now it is possible to transform an RDF representation into this ontology log uh, representation. I would say that this is a more efficient way to express uh, 
an ontology when you have multiple values. When you've just got a tag value set up, and so this, this was prepared by this person, then there's no particular advantage in doing it this way. Uh, so you have these types of mismatches when you actually want to try and incorporate it, incorporate stuff but in. It's a clear list, it's a long list, it's yes. not an explosion, that's my point. Oh, okay. Now, the, the <laughs> formats problem, explosion of formats, we discussed that obviously after the day yesterday, yes. um, and there was the wish for a standard format, um, and um, clarity w was driven, um, and we have heard today about uh, Diamond wanting to, to uh, still arrive at uh, the Nexus standardized format. So there is elements of, of wanting to arrive at a standard format, but nevertheless there is still uh, a growing diversity. Um, but the data processing uh, software people are managing that diversity. It's yes. not an explosion. Well, I mean, Vladek might want to uh, comment on that. I mean, he's obviously managing it, but, but first of all, let's... My point being on the word semant uh, the semantic aspect of the word explosion it is a colourful word yes. that is trying to imply not managed. And I think that's not okay, fair. Okay, all right, okay. I'll, I'll take that point. It was uh, perhaps over-egging the pudding. Uh, but there's certainly a lot... I would say there's more work is being done than needs to be done simply because it's oh, not being managed as well as it could oh, be. Yeah, yes, duplication yeah. um, must be avoided. But I, I need to pick up that point you said about um, Diamond moving to Nexus, and that's a single format. It's only a single format in the sense of it's all HDF5. But as soon as you have a different scan axis, you have a different format. And I think, I mean, I haven't spoken to Vladek, but I think that's what he meant when he said there are 192 different image formats. It's just maybe there's one entry in the header that's different. So the syntax is the same, but it's a different format. And, and the ESRF are not producing just one Nexus format. They're producing <laughs> 20, 30, 40. And a programmer, and the reason they're different formats is a programmer has to actually program for each one of those different formats as far as the semantic content goes. If they're just passing it through to the user, then they don't. Agreed. Plus, goniostats. Yes, we have different description of the goniostat, and you have four or five possible goniostats. Right. So that's a semantic. Yes, so, so, so you see that we are t only taking angles from the uh, header, uh, and there is always one of the uh, five uh, possible goniostats, and you have. Uh, zeros of the gonios that is also de defined in dev site. So this is dev site file. So, this is so you see that basically my point is that if you have dev site file for HKM, if you have dev site file, you can process any data from uh, any virtually any uh, synchrotron station or uh, home source. Now you may have something special, and we, from time to time, we have something special. But the, the real problem is that the configuration on many beamlines changes. And people even do not know that they are changing configuration. Yes, they are doing various things. They do not know that this affects the processing. They find some way to do that for, to work for their uh, beamline, but it not necessarily works for another ne uh, neighbor of beamline, which has exactly the same goniostat and exactly the same detector. I do not know how this can be solved. Yes, I mean, when we are talking about universal format, before we will start to rewrite everything what was collected into this new format, we should have this new format on at least 60, on half of the beam lines all over the world. I, and I, th I think that it's almost impossible. Yeah, I, should make, I mean, I wasn't talking about a universal format. I was talking about a universal metadata 
or Perhaps universal yeah, metadata. Yeah, yeah. So that's yes, but you see that there are, there, in fact, there are two types of metadata. One type is from single experiment. Yes, we have single experiment, sing, few data sets from single experiment. And we can derive some metadata from this experiment. But this will be very limited. But if you have, let's say, 1,000 experiments done on this beamline, you can derive some expectation when your crystal will die. And we have done that on 21 ID. Yes, we put the effort, we made very many experiments. And basically, if you are giving the composition of the sample now, you have some feeling when your uh, crystal will die. Yes, when radiation damage is such that you, you cannot continue. And, and it depends, obviously, on many, many factors. And, but, you, but one of these factors is the temperature at the sample. And if you will uh, look at the PDB, do you know that temperature of the sample is not correlated with the beamline, is not correlated with anything else but PI. Yes, so PI, there is one PI which always <laughs> collect data in 113.5, no matter on what beamline he is, he collects the data, yes? Somebody put 113.5. Yes, and in, but if you will look at the crystal decay, you can say something, but not on one set, but on many sets. You can set something also about the quality of the cooling. And if chairman will allow me to say one anecdote, but this is quickly, yes. But you see, I used to consult for one Beamline, and I will not mention it. And they were very pride, proud that they have phenomenal intensity because crystals are dying uh, like hell. Yes, and at some point I brought lipoxygenase, the crystal which I knew very well, and I found that intensity is not very high. But really, the crystal is dying very fast. So I ask, what is the temperature of the sample in the place where it's sample? And they told me, oh, it's 100. And I said, can we have thermocouple? Uh, we do not have thermocouple. Can we take from control room? Oh, no, 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 there is no way uh, to do that. There is no need to do that. Why? And you see, in in the end, I spent uh, around $100. We drank a lot of alcohol, and when we came back, I forced them to go to the control room to borrow a thermocouple. It was 140 wow. Kelvin. So it was fixed. Next time I came there, it was again 140. <laughs> Yes, guys. So the, 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 point, the point being that just because something is in the file as metadata doesn't mean it's true. Yeah. So there's going to be a point of decreasing returns. I can see that where you, know, you don't want to... But you see, that, that what I'm saying, that fixing the cooling device is more of the five device, which each costs $3 million. So I think that's a very valid point made. And of course, uh, I suppose the point about metadata is metadata is not just values, but it's uh, intimately bound up with relationships. And one of its main functions, I think, is as validation. <coughs> so I'd like to give Herbert just this opportunity using a slightly low-tech version to come in over Skype. Um, he's happy to type his comments if uh, James will speak to them. I just want to say, says Herbert, I agree completely with James. Not quite completely. My only disagreement is that we will need 
a right values pseudocode suggestion for each format. Want to respond to that, James? Uh, so, as I understand the question, uh, Herbert uh, uh, thinks that a right values pseudocode would also be good. My only, the only reason I left that out was because I felt that you wouldn't necessarily know for a given format uh, how you wanted to um, uh, use that format. Uh, so so the, the concept being that um, the reason you're using a different format is because, because that format gives you some advantage in terms of efficient transfer or efficient storage or some other non-ontological uh, reason. And so it may well be that you could use the same format and the same ontology, but uh, with a different purpose, in which case you might want to store the, the data in a slightly different way. That's the only, uh, and therefore you couldn't write a universal write values uh, function. But you could imagine writing a few to say, well, this is if you want to have a minimum size, this is if you want to have a fast transfer. I'm thinking of a sophisticated format here. I don't think, I think in the case of SIF, there's only really one way to write it, but I suspect in Nexus there are quite a few ways that you could write a consistent Nexus file. So is that an adequate response, Herbert? And we'll see if we get a comment back. Uh, it says away. It says away at the top. It's gone away. Just while we're waiting, I suppose uh, one point about a, a pseudocode function is that it does not need to be too specific. So there may be circumstances in which your pseudo writer simply gathers together the necessary information you want to combine in an output. Yeah, I, uh, haven't, I haven't attempted to write one of these. I've attempted to write a get value, but I haven't done the other one. So Nexus in particular has strange right rules. No argument from me, Herbert. And you would know much better than I. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, an interesting point that's probably a little bit too specific for this is that if you are linking data to somewhere else, that's implicitly saying that the parent group is not relevant. Uh, that's uh, an interesting, an interesting uh, point that I would make, is that making a link means that you don't really care what the parent group is. But, I mean, I think that's one, a conversation for me and Herbert to have, rather than for everyone here. So my feeling is that the, uh, the difficulty in communicating uh, at this level suggests that uh, this is a conversation we could very usefully have uh, online um, in one of our forums. <sighs> Well, I don't, I don't agree, I don't see your point, Herbert, that you would need extra metadata in order to write those links. I would have thought those links are um, specific to the Nexus format rather than being something to do with, the sci with scientific knowledge. I mean, that was, that was the point of my statement, that um, the information doesn't depend on the format, that scientific truth or scientific facts don't depend on the format. So you can't say that because you put a link in there, you somehow created some scientific information that wasn't there before. So let me wrap up the discussion uh, at the moment Ooh, because time down. is against us. <laughs> but Herbert agrees on that comment. Uh, so thank you again, James, for very stimulating. So I'll hand over to my co-chair and ask if I have a few moments to give a presentation.